Having thus shown some of the duties which we owe to a government when morally constituted, it may be proper in the eighth place to state the reasons why we cannot yield obedience for conscience' sake to the present civil authority in North America. And, number one, the federal constitution, or instrument of national union, does not even recognize the existence of God, the King of Nations. In these civil deeds, though the immediate end may be the happiness of the commonwealth, yet the ultimate end, as well in this as in every other thing we do, should be the glory of God. Ought not men, in the formation of their deeds, to consider their responsibility to the moral government, and this obligation to acknowledge his authority? Proverbs 3, verse 5, quote, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths, unquote. That a national deed, employed about the fundamental stipulations of magistracy as an ordinance of God, and the investiture of magistrates as her ministers, should nowhere recognize the existence of the governor of the universe, is, to say nothing worse of it, truly lamentable. May it not be said of this nation as of Israel in Hosea 8, verse 4, quote, They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Unquote. Did not the framers of this instrument act not only as if not only as if there had been no divine revelation for the supreme standard of their conduct, but also as if there had been no God? Did they not in this resemble the fool mentioned in Psalm 14, verse 1, who, quote, said in his heart there is no god unquote. every official act of the government is a pro excuse me every official act of the government of a province excuse me must have some specific stamp of his dependence upon the authority which appointed him and shall a nation act as if independent of the god of the universe and expect to be guiltless number 2 another objection we have is that most if not all of the state constitutions contain positive immorality Witness their recognition of such rights of conscience as sanction every blasphemy which a depraved heart may believe to be true. Moreover, the state constitutions necessarily bind to the support of the federal as the bond of national existence, and hence the immorality contained in that instrument becomes common to them all. The recognition of such rights of conscience is insulting to the majesty of heaven and repugnant to the express letter of God's word in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. God prescribes to the magistrate the divine law as the supreme standard of all his administrations and which obliges men in every station to conduct themselves accordingly. Deuteronomy 12, verse 32, quote, What things soever I command you observe to do it, thou shalt not add to it nor diminish from it, unquote. But, in the framing of these constitutions, the revealed law of God is not attended to, though even the law of nature requires the adoption of every new communication which God, in mercy, may be pleased to reveal. The rejection of the divine law as revealed in the scriptures of truth we consider as a contempt of the beneficence of heaven and an obstinate drawing back to heathenism. Number three, the government gives a legal security and establishment to gross heresy blasphemy and idolatry under the notion of liberty of conscience it would be too tedious to examine each of the state constitutions on this head one may suffice we shall select that of the state of pennsylvania see the preamble together with the third and twenty-sixth sections of the ninth article here the constitution recognizes and unalterably establishes the indefeasible right of worshiping almighty god whatever way a man's conscience may dictate and declares that this shall forever remain inviolable. We believe that no man has a right to worship God in any way other than the way he himself has prescribed in his law. We also think it criminal for a man's conscience to approve any way repugnant to this sacred rule, and that this crime cannot legitimate another, or make an action right which God expressly condemns under pain of eternal wrath. If conscience can legitimate what God's law condemns, it must be paramount to the divine law, and, consequently, to the legislator also, in having a negative over the requisitions of both the one and the other. Were this the case, it would not only free from criminality, but would render virtuous, laudable, and praiseworthy the most damnable errors, the most horrid blasphemies, and detestable abominations. But if dictated by the consciences of pagans, Mohammedans, etc., 
Then the Egyptians, worshipping God under the form of a snake or crocodile, as lawful, yea, as commendable, as doing it would be precisely according to the manner which he has prescribed in his word, provided that, in both cases, conscience said, Amen. But supposing for a moment that men had such a right, let us inquire how they came about it. Either they must have had it, excuse me, they must have it by derivation from God, or hold it independently of him. It cannot be by derivation from God. It would be absurd in the nature of it, and incompatible with the essential holiness of his character, to suppose God giving his moral subjects a law to the breach of which he annexes eternal punishment, and at the same time, giving them a right to break it, is inconsistent and impossible. Right would be opposed to right, a right to obey and a right not to obey. Absurd as this may appear, we find the doctrine advocated both from pulpit and press. Scarcely anywhere, however, is it more barefacedly maintained than in the following declaration, quote, To worship God after that way and manner they judge most agreeable to his will, is a right common to all men. They may and often do err and offend the Most High by substituting a false religion in place of that which he requires, but no power on earth can take their right from them. Unquote. And here a footnote. See the Declaration and Testimony of the Associate Presbytery of Pennsylvania, Part 1, Section 17. Here there is a certain right established. To do what? to worship God whatever way a man may think most proper. But he may and often does think a false way most proper. Well, he has a right to worship the false way. But worshiping the false way offends God. No matter, he has a right to offend God. For if worshiping falsely and offending God are equivalent, seeing he has a right to do the one, he has a right to do the other. Quote, Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph, unquote. 2 Samuel 1, verse 20. To maintain that men have a right to break the divine law is too glaring. Does it not look very like blasphemy to allow that God has given them such a right? If they have it, therefore it must be independently of him. It would be pretty nice to draw the discriminating... Uh, the, excuse me. It would be pretty nice to draw the discriminating line between this and atheism. This pretended right, however, is guaranteed to all by the constitution of the state. Everything suggested by conscience, which may not interfere with temporal safety, is unalterably established by the permanent law of the land. Should it dictate obstinately to profess the most damnable heresy, and zealously practice and propagate every absurd and abominable form of idolatry, which a heart given up to strong delusions, vile affections, and a reprobate sense could make one think innocent. The good people of this state have recognized his right to do so, and so solemnly pledged themselves in their constitutional instrument to give him security and protection, the solemn prohibition of Almighty God notwithstanding. Does not this amount to an establishment of religion? that civil rulers should exercise their power in protecting and defending the religion of Jesus, we do, and always did, maintain. The dispute, then, will not turn upon the point whether religion should be civilly established. We take it for granted that Americans think so, seeing they have done it. But it is concerning what religion ought to be civilly established and protected, whether the religion of Jesus alone should be countenanced by civil authority, or every blasphemous, heretical, and idolatrous abomination which the subtle malignity of the old serpent and a heart deceitful above all things and desperately wicked can frame and, despise, and devise excuse me, should be put on an equal footing therewith. The former we contend for, the latter we reject. The latter, however, is the plain doctrine of the Constitution. That it may appear that this is no invidious comment on the articles of that instrument, let us for a moment attend to its application to practice by the legislature. Their views of it will be considered as impartial. In the discharge of their legislative duty, did they not incorporate a Roman Catholic society in the city of Philadelphia and grant them special privileges, such as raising money by lottery, etc., for erecting a chapel? Who ever heard any of the approvers of the Constitution complain that said law of incorporation was unconstitutional? Indeed, no man of common sense could allow that it was. If this be an evil, 
the Constitution should be purged from such principles as sanction it, unless it be contended that the people of these states have among them rights, one of which authorizes them to give their power to the beast, and prop up the tottering fabric of that man of sin, whom God has threatened to, quote, destroy with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming, unquote. We cannot, in conscience, however, ill others may look upon it, swear allegiance to a constitution so friendly to the enemies of Jesus. We are bound to him, and cannot serve two masters. Is this putting of all religious sects upon an equal footing consistent with the declaration concerning New Testament times in Isaiah 49, verse 23, quote, Kings shall be thy nursing fathers, unquote? Would he not be a hard-hearted father who would put his child upon the same footing with the wolves, tigers, and other voracious beasts of prey? The political father who leaves the child truth in the jaws of enemies still more deadly cannot be allowed to possess much more tender feelings. Will the Church of Christ enjoy no other privilege than this by, quote, sucking the breast of kings, unquote, Isaiah 60, verse 16, quote, when her officers shall be peace and her exactors righteousness, unquote, Isaiah 60, verse 17.